Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities needed it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. Today, we continue our conversation about the opportunities and challenges of addressing climate change with two people who were on the ground in Glasgow, Scotland at the Global Climate Conference. Rob Warner is the New Hampshire State Director for the League of Conservation Voters, a Concord City Council member, and a longtime New Deal leader. Josh Freed is the leader of Third Way's Climate and Energy Program. He oversees the strategy to advance policies so the United States gets to net zero by 2050 as quickly and equitably as possible. Both Josh and Rob see a lot of opportunities for communities, businesses, and organizations in the transition to a more environmentally sustainable future. I left feeling more optimistic than I have in a long time about our capacity to benefit from addressing climate change. Enjoy. Rob Warner and Josh Freed, welcome to An Honorable Profession. It is great to be talking to you today about the climate crisis and our global response to it. So I want to start with Rob. We've known each other as New Dealers for a long time, but um, you've been in Glasgow representing the New Hampshire League of Conservation Voters. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen on the ground, what we should be hopeful about, what we should be nervous about? Well, first of all, you know, it's interesting to be here. Thanks uh, for the invite to be in this conversation today, certainly. But um, yeah, there's a lot of people here. I mean, there's, you know, 30,000 or more people that are in the streets in the blue zone, which is the secure zone, the green zone, which is the, the public zone, so to speak, where a lot of events happen as well. But, you know, the thing that really stands out to me in terms of the sort of vibe in, in Glasgow is the, is the youth and the, the presence, activism, and, and noise of, of the youth and, and their demands around, around action. I do think that they are being heard. I, you know, I, as I talked to Ryan earlier, I had to been reminded in, in reading some things today that Generation Z uh, comprises about 2.5 billion people across the globe, certainly the largest cohort of population on the globe. And uh, it's been a real hallmark, I think, of, of this COP, Conference of the Parties, around the activism and the visibility of, of youth. And do you see it actually shaping and moving policy? I, you, you read reports that the, the delegates are... A- partly afraid, maybe partly inspired, feeling some pressure. Do you feel like it's made a difference that the activism in the streets? I do. And I do. I, I like how you phrase that partly inspired, partly afraid, because I think for uh, policies to move forward, I don't think that's a bad combination. <laughs> you know, one of the things that's interesting about the wording of this agreement, which, by the way, the conference has been extended, it was supposed to end Day. They're working through tonight. It's Friday here in Glasgow. And it's not expected that this agreement will be delivered now until Saturday or possibly Sunday. And there, there are some contentious issues. But one of the really interesting things is that in the wording of this agreement around the phase out of fossil fuels, that had never been expressed, never been included in any COP document before coming out of one of these gatherings until now. And while the wording continues to be massaged, so to speak, around that, the fact that it it exists, and remember, this is a consensus process that the UN runs, so it's not always easy to get to the this, these kinds of language aspects. But that that's really significant. And then, so I, I think there's been some impact of of youth of, uh, 
on that in terms of having to act now and needing to act now and the urgency of, of the action that's needed. Good. Let's hope uh, over the next couple of days, there's even more action and more ur- urgency. Josh, the third way, and you specifically have really been pushing policy both domestically and globally. Can you talk about what you're seeing and where you think the opportunities are and where the challenges lay ahead? Yeah, and it's, it's great to be here and great to join both you and, and Rob in this conversation. It's I got back from uh, the Conference of Parties conference uh, at Glasgow just under a week ago, and and I will agree with Rob in, in particular on the energy and passion and and focus from I think everyone who was there, both activists and others on the streets, as well as participants within the the blue zone as you referred to, which is where a lot of the non-governmental participants, as well as the delegates gathered every day, really reinforced that we are at a different point in the conversation to focus on climate. And it, it also highlighted to me that the conference and its outcomes, and we, we won't know the outcomes likely until long after the extra time of the negotiations are concluded and a document is signed, it really struck me as a, a tale of two conferences where you had a lot of passion and protest and urging on the streets for countries and companies to do more and act more quickly. But I will say even there, it'll be interesting to see whether those voices and demands can switch from mobilization to organization. And then And we can get back to that and discuss it if if it's of interest. And then also to see whether the non-specific commitments to act end up getting specific actions, transparency, and measurements assigned to them. And so there's a lot of dollar figures that are being discussed that will be invested in both deploying existing technologies like renewables, and keeping existing nuclear plants open and getting a lot more electric vehicles deployed, as well as discussions of investment in the technologies we still need, such as energy storage, advanced nuclear, carbon removal, and on and on. Will those come to anywhere near the dollar figures or the amount of deployment necessary? Will we be able to preserve the amount of forest land and and other natural solutions to remove carbon from the atmosphere and then store it that are necessary. Will countries actually act on the commitments that they're saying they're going to to reduce emissions and particularly be transparent about it, given what we heard and saw in in recent reports and the Washington Post did an excellent job covering this early uh, the week of, of October 8th on concerns that some of the countries that have stated they've reduced emissions by a certain amount, actually haven't come close to that mark. And so that's why I came away from Glasgow, not sure yet what I saw and not sure how hopeful and and how much caution I should bring back with the optimism um, from participating in an event where you had, as as Rob mentioned, 30,000 plus people all mobilized and, and galvanized to really address climate. Can I follow that up with both of you about this? So we've all been involved in policymaking, and this is as complex a policy area as any, maybe in history, in that it's global, there's adaptation, there's prevention, there's private sector, nonprofit sector, governments. To your point about the difference between mobilization and then organization and implementation, how do, especially those of us at the local government level or citizens who are, you know, who want to engage on this issue, make sure that that we do get the comprehensive approach that, that we so urgently need? And I guess, Josh, why don't we start and then Rob, you know, right back to your experience in Concord at the local level. It's such a great question. And I think that as a person who practices policy at the national and international level, always being reminded that it needs to be anchored and start locally 
is so critically important. And it's not just about the actions that are taken to remove carbon from the atmosphere, reduce people's impact on climate change, but also what are the benefits? And we heard time and time again, particularly when talking to people who live in areas that are reliant on heavy industry or fossil fuels for a living, that there's a lot of fear there. Even that they see climate change is happening, we're sometimes missing the connection of the benefits locally that can be had from addressing climate change to communities and even to individuals who are currently relying on the extraction of coal, the refining of, of petroleum for their, for their livelihoods and for the financial lifeblood to the community. And so I think taking that step back and, and recognizing that whether we're thinking about policy, what jobs are gonna be created where, what are the local impacts on air pollution, on water quality, and on and on, with the national or international solutions we're talking about when addressing climate change is critically important. And I also, the other point I think that's really important on this is, yes, we need to reduce and eliminate our use and reliance on fossil fuels. I think sometimes the language though, at least from the way third way approaches on it, we can sometimes get caught too much in what we need to stop doing and miss out on really discussing as much the, the broad set of opportunities. And again, that connects back to your point about local communities and making sure that we recognize it's less about ending fossil fuels, at least in, in, in our perspective, and much more about creating the kinds of electricity generation, ways to power our industry and our cars and trucks and on and on that are cleaner and create different types of jobs and ideally more jobs where people live and work now, because there's, we heard a lot of, of fear from people, even some who are at, at the COP, but certainly people who weren't taxi drivers, whose family members may still or recently worked in, in the coal industry or in the offshore natural gas industry and on and on when they hear, oh, you're gonna talk about climate, there's, there's two sides to that coin. So I think anchoring all of these conversations in what matters locally becomes critically important. And more of that pulling up to the national level is, is and international is really, really necessary. I love that idea to focus less on what we're going to stop doing and more on what we're going to start doing and have it be a, a much more optimistic picture. Rob, you're going to go from a global gathering to a Concord City Council meeting. So you are going to live this experience in a really fundamental way. Can you talk about what you bring back and, and how you see this on the ground in, in your state, in your community? Yes. So, you know, over the last week, I attended a lot of discussions and events that are connected to what's called the local government municipal authority constituency. This is how you know, these UN gatherings are, are often organized in terms of these constituencies and the events that happen at side events, you know, in the blue zone and, and other places. Um, so as a city councilor, you know, in Concord, we have made a commitment of 100% renewable energy and electricity by 2030. What was very clear from these events is this consistent message from local officials that no matter what the outcome of COP is, no matter what the wording of the agreement is, no matter how ambitious it is or, or, or not, it still is the, is the case that cities are the implementers. You have goals that are being made globally by nations, by states, and oftentimes, as I mentioned, by local authorities, municipalities, but the bottom line is that we at the local level are the implementers, meaning that we need to, to really get on with it in terms of deploying renewable energy resources in our communities, which is what we're doing in Concord, uh, doing our part. We need good policies at the federal level and the state level to help us do that and to be consistent and to give us the flexibility 
uh, to do that. And that, that's something that, that we really work on at our local level and certainly at the state house in Concord. I also want to pick up on something that, that Josh touched on in terms of, you know, what we might call, you know, legacy uh, energy. And that is that I, I think that we do need to step back and, and listen to people and communities that are historically dependent upon fossil fuels, because it is far more than a job to these folks. It is cultural. It is identity. And to fail to recognize that and to engage with people on that basis is politically and disastrous, in my view, and also does not help put forward the policy that can actually create jobs, new opportunity for people. It's interesting because uh, Mayor Bill Peduto from Pittsburgh was at an event and he described how, you know, Pittsburgh had gone through, you know, many different kinds of economic decline and resurgence with the steel industry in particular. You talked about, again, sort of the cultural aspect and how do you build trust amongst folks that what you're talking about, I, I can understand it in the abstract sense. I could perhaps see the opportunity that you're talking about, but how do you really make that happen for me? And do you care about me and my life and my experience? And I just, I really think that's, that's quite important. My, my spouse actually is, is the granddaughter of a coal miner, coal mining family from Northeast Pennsylvania. So I feel like I have some, some sensitivity to this. Uh, she bends my ear about this all the time and I am, and she's right. I think that's an incredibly important point about understanding the culture and the and the and fear and and the as Josh talked about the opportunity. <laughs> I want to come back to what was a uh, big political opportunity that that got very complicated and messy in its communications, but could have a good impact at the end of the day, which is the infrastructure bill that uh, I think we've we managed to uh, our party managed to totally confuse and, you know, take away the, the, the real improvement that we're making in people's lives by having a long extended and overly complicated debate. But in an effort to fix that, Josh, do you want to talk about how the infrastructure bill that was just passed fits into, you know, our goals and the implementation? And then Rob, we can talk about what that means in in your communities and other similar cities, your size. Yeah. And, and look, I think, one of the things, unfortunately, the country and particularly the press in Washington covering the debate in Congress has, has forgotten is that legislating is always messy. I think Rob in particular, given the size of the New, the New Hampshire legislature, can talk at length about that experience. But I think we see this across the nation in state legislatures where they often get things done, but it, it takes a little while. There's a lot of drama and back and forth. And it doesn't get covered like a sporting event where every different change in decision or control is depicted as life or death. And so in well, while well, the process for passing the bipartisan infrastructure bill may have felt extenuated and chaotic, in the end, even taking a step back and saying, in a nation as polarized as ours, we had an historic investment supported by Democrats and Republicans in Congress after hearing about Infrastructure Week for the four years of the previous administration. That alone shows that things in Washington may be working a little bit better than the headlines from certain newspapers and uncertain TV uh, cable networks uh, depict. Now, what does that mean for the average American? It really means that for the first time in decades, we are on the brink of seeing the kinds of investment in roads and bridges, in fixing our water infrastructure, in clean energy innovation. So we have all the technologies that states and cities and localities can get access to, to provide the kinds of resources they need to get to clean that we haven't had. And infrastructure 
is really the backbone for the entire economy, for the health of our communities. And we haven't paid nearly as much attention to it as we've needed to to stay competitive in, in recent decades. So we're, we're going to have this opportunity, and it means two things. One is it's going to enable the United States to compete more globally and create more opportunities to provide the rest of the world with clean energy so that other countries can come to us and say, oh, we'd like affordable wind, we'd like affordable uh, smart grid components, affordable advanced nuclear technology, and that will help us meet our climate goals. But as importantly, probably more importantly for people who, who live around this country, they're gonna find that it's easier to get from point A to point B and they're gonna have more options. They're gonna find that they have better drinking water and towns and communities are actually gonna have money that they can spend for this. Whereas they've always had to scrimp and save to figure out how to do any of this in the past. Totally agree. And I hope that message gets out sooner rather than later, ideally before the 2022 elections. Rob, can you talk about what the infrastructure bill means for New Hampshire generally and Concord specifically? Well, sure. I mean, as an example, a month or so ago, I had an opportunity to organize an event with uh, Congressman Chris Pappas of the 1st Congressional District here in New Hampshire, where we went to the Seabrook Wastewater Treatment Plant. Now, Seabrook is a coastal community uh, right on the Massachusetts New Hampshire border. Its wastewater treatment plant sits in marshy land that people didn't necessarily expect would be subject to the threat that it is now. We talked about the infrastructure bill in terms of its practical effect for a community like Seabrook in terms of upgrading its plant and hardening it for projected sea level rise. Because we know that whatever we do now in terms of however ambitious we can be and we can pass the, the utmost perfect climate agreement and start on the road, there's so much baked in to sea level rise, for example, we know that it's going to happen. So we have to have adaptation as well as mitigation. And so that's a really practical aspect. And the town manager, Seabrook, he, he said, you know, we have to have this partnership with the federal government because there's no way that we can tax our citizens to the extent that we really need to do to fix this, to make this facility viable for the longer term. So that's a very practical aspect for for our community so we need broadband that's another you know particularly in in new hampshire as an economic development aspect that's critical in terms of both educational aspects and delivering you know education but also economic development uh, small business they've got to have access to you know high speed internet to be able to to thrive and so that that's something i think that i hope that will be quite obvious to folks uh, in terms of their future opportunities. But I will say that we have a hell of a marketing job ahead of us and we're behind the curve because I, you know, I think we, we all had hope that this infrastructure bill would be, have been passed this past summer. to give us more time to, to explain and to have folks really feel it. So it's late in the hour on that in terms of, you know, impact of next year, but all is not lost, but we really have to get out there and explain and show people what the benefit to them in their everyday lives are, because that's really the bottom line. What does government mean to me? And is it improving my life? And if it's improving my life, maybe I'll vote again for the people that are improving my life. Yeah. And I think just to build on that, what Rob Rob's last point is so important we we all need to get this conversation out of DC and out of the halls of Congress and state and local, not just elected officials, though they will be at the vanguard of explaining why this actually matters to people, but also the impacted business and community leaders, the impacted public health officials who can see the benefits on the uh, on, on air and water, uh, people who are going to be benefiting both school kids and also businesses from broadband need to have the opportunity and, and we all need to provide them the platform to tell these stories themselves 
both because they're more trusted in the community, but also it is important that we address major national and global issues like climate change. We have to do that. We have to do that with urgency. It's hard to sometimes focus on that and believe that is what is going to compel you to pull the lever and vote for someone if you're really worried about the viability of your community or whether you can have uh, an opportunity to open a business or do distant learning, whatever you need to do, if you're not seeing services and jobs and other opportunities delivered to where you live. And it's, it's very rare that Washington and elected officials in Washington are able to tell those stories, let alone tell them without a lot of on the ground validation and amplification from local elected officials and the people in the community they know and are trusted by. Well, absolutely. One other thing to follow on quickly is, uh, you know, the opportunity that we have in New England, it's something that I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on is, is offshore wind. Huge potential in New England and the Gulf of Maine. We already see a project, you know, getting ready to turn the switch on in Massachusetts. But we have to strengthen the grid in New England. You know, we're all part of one grid in our, in our six New England states. And, you know, on the one hand, we all know that we have to electrify everything. In order to electrify everything, we have to upgrade our grid. And I'm very happy to see this money in the infrastructure bill to, to start to do that. Because if we're going to be delivering these uh, large amounts of energy from offshore wind, as we hope throughout New England, which is going to produce economic opportunity, the jobs, the supply chain for this, this project and, the, and this whole aspect and industry is amazingly huge and beneficial. We've got to be able to strengthen and expand our, our capability of our grid to, to move in that direction. Absolutely. And I guess I want to ask both of you, like, this is a major, as, as Josh pointed out at the beginning, right? This is a major opportunity. It's not just a, a challenge to be overcome and a transition needs to be made. But as, as our economy shift and our en energy sources shift and everything else shifts, how do you advise communities or even small companies or nonprofits to position themselves to benefit from this shift, right? Because it feels like there's big systems, international finance, everything else is at play here. And it's hard to understand always how your local community fits into that. What should, what should local policymakers and people just engage in their communities be thinking about when they're looking at these big changes that are, that are, that are coming and hopefully come sooner rather than later? Well, I mean, on the local level, for example, I was very happy and proud that when we made our 100% renewable energy commitment, that we engaged with our local Concord Area Chamber of Commerce. And it was a bit of a challenge at first because they were, you know, some of the folks were skeptical. Are you really telling me that, you know, this large move to renewable energy is going to save us money over the long term? And we were able to marshal a lot of resources and and connect them with folks that convinced them that that indeed would be the case. And so when it came time for our resolution, the president of our, our chamber came and testified in, in favor of it, and their board voted unanimously to support it. And we continue to engage with, um, with the chamber and, and other leaders in our community, educational leaders and so forth, um, because I think they, they do understand that you know, the benefit of moving towards a clean energy economy, uh, we have to do it for the environment, for climate. But what I always want to talk about is doing it in a way that's going to create economic opportunity, jobs, economic security, and wealth for folks. And, and I think you know, I very, feel very strongly that, you know, that, that combination of of message is important because we it, it also springs from an aspect of hope that yes we can find our way out of this and we can find a way out of it that's going to be economically and environmentally beneficial. Josh, in the final moments here, where where if you're a local policymaker or entrepreneur, where where are you spending your time? What are you looking at? I think it's important as we talked a lot about the the need for local leaders, community leaders, entrepreneurs 
to be at the vanguard of both the shift toward clean and also explaining it, that they also embrace a bold pragmatism and understanding that solutions look different from community to community. There's an opportunity here to really embrace the modernization of our economy and our energy system in the 21st century, the way at the end of the 20th century, we did around telecommunications. And there were a lot of concerns, understandably, as we saw the move from analog systems to digital. But in the end, despite the challenges we may see in social media and other things, the benefits have been extraordinary. There, there's the same opportunity here, and we need to recognize that what might fit Concord, New Hampshire is gonna look different in Charleston, West Virginia, and is gonna look different in Flint, Michigan. And each of these communities can learn from each other and find ways to collaborate and also find ways to create opportunities for each of them. And I think, for example, the offshore wind that's extremely exciting and critically needed in Maine can complement a community in Wyoming that may build an advanced nuclear reactor to power that region in the country. And conversations that can be had at that level can really start building and create the kind of every clean energy technology, every job, every opportunity we need that can trickle up because we know trickle down doesn't work to the national level and get the kind of comprehensive change that I think we're seeing with Build Back Better and with the infrastructure bill, but we're gonna need a lot more of it and we're gonna need it a lot more consistently in the years to come. That's a great way to end. Each community needs to chart their own path, learn from one another, perhaps steal some ideas from one another and then get those ideas up to scale, whether it's the state or federal or global level as, as quickly as possible. Gentlemen, I wanna thank you for taking the time. It's been a good and frankly, the optimistic conversation that I think I needed and many other folks needed around climate change. And uh, I, I appreciate your work and your advocacy and your willingness to be sort of on the ground in Glasgow, pushing optimistic solutions forward and opportunities forward. Well, thank you for the uh, part of it and be able to tune in from, uh, from Glasgow, Scotland. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders and keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.